Today we have a really interesting trigonometric integral. It's the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of fractional part tangent x divided by tangent x dx. And the curly braces here denote the fractional part function, which returns the fractional part of the real number you plug in. For example, if you plug in 69.420, then you get its fractional part, which is 0 0.420. And a close relative of the fractional part function is the floor function, which returns the integer part of the real number you plug in. So if we plug in 69.420, we get 69. So these two examples are really nice. They're really nice because they give you an understanding of the relationship between the fractional part function and the floor function. And it's pretty easy to see the fractional part x equals x minus floor x. And it's this relationship that we're going to use. We're going to use this relationship in the evaluation of our integral, let's call it i for reference purposes, plus a couple of other tools, including a decomposition of the integral operator that I've grown to like. So using the relationship we have written out here, we can write our integral as the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of tangent x minus floor tangent x divided by tangent x dx. And on simplification, we have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of 1 minus floor tangent x divided by tangent x dx. Now using the linearity of the integration operator, we can write this as the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of 1 with respect to x, which of course sorts out to pi by 2, minus the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of floor tangent x divided by tangent x dx. Now, how on earth do you integrate a floor function integral that to involving the floor function of a trigonometric function? Well, to answer that question, we have to analyze the behavior of our integrand on the interval from 0 to pi by 2. And that's a pretty captivating journey because it involves a decomposition of the integral operator on this interval from 0 to pi by 2. And how exactly are we going to carry this out? Well, we can write this as the limit of the integral from 0 to y. Oh, terribly sorry about that as y approaches pi by 2. And now I'm going to perform a transformation of limits. I'm going to let y be the inverse tangent of some other variable, call it z. So this transforms the limit into a limit of the integral from the inverse tangent of 0 to the inverse tangent of z as z approaches, well, for y to approach pi by 2, we need z to approach positive infinity, right? So this is what our integral operator now looks like. And I'm not proud of what I'm going to do next, but it's okay for notation purposes for the purpose of this video. So I'm going to write this as the integral from the inverse tangent of 0 to the inverse tangent of infinity. Again, not proud of this notation, but it's cool for now, at least for the purpose of this video. It's a lot better than writing the limit operator again and again. Okay, cool. So we transformed the integral from an integral from 0 to pi by 2 to an integral from inverse tangent 0 to inverse tangent positive infinity. And how is this a decomposition of the integral operator? Well, it's not a decomposition yet. I can write this as the sum over the non-negative integers k of the integrals from the inverse tangent of k to the inverse tangent of k plus 1. Yeah, that should cover it. And that is just awesome. This is beautiful. So that means our integral i here transforms into pi by 2 minus the integral, oh, sorry about that. It's now a sum of integrals, a sum over the non-negative integers k of the integrals from the inverse tangent of k to the inverse tangent of k plus 1 of floor tangent x divided by tangent x dx. And how did all of that fancy stuff help? Well, notice something. We're integrating from inverse tangent k to inverse tangent k plus 1, right? That means our x variable here lies between the inverse tangent of k plus 1 and the inverse tangent of k.
This implies that the tangent of x lies between k plus 1 and k. And this is awesome. That means that the floor function evaluated at tangent x on these intervals just gives us k, which is just brilliant, and it simplifies our work a lot. So all that hard work most definitely paid off because we have a much simpler version of our integration problem. So we can write i as pi by 2 minus the sum over the non-negative integers k of the integrals from inverse tangent k to inverse tangent k plus 1 of replacing the floor of tangent x by the k variable. We have k divided by tangent x dx. And notice for the k equals 0 case, we have the integral from inverse tangent k to inverse tangent k plus 1 of 0, which is, of course, 0. So we can just ignore that and perform the sum over the positive integers instead of the non-negative ones. OK, so starting our index variable k at k plus at k equals 1 now and writing the integrand as k times the cotangent of x because the cotangent of x has a pretty cool antiderivative. It's the logarithm of sine x. That means on integration, we have i being equal to pi by 2 minus the sum over the positive integers k of k times the logarithm of sine x with the limits being inverse tangent k and inverse tangent k plus 1. And how exactly do we evaluate the antiderivative at these limits? Okay, so we need the logarithm of a sine function and the limits are inverse tangents. So let's just invoke some basic trigonometry. Let's call the inverse tangent of some variable y as phi, which implies that the tangent of phi equals y, or the perpendicular of our right angle triangle is y, and the base of it is 1, which implies that the sine, oh, terribly sorry about that, the sine of phi, and remember what phi was, phi was the inverse tangent of y. So the sine of the inverse tangent of y equals y divided by the square root of 1 plus y squared. So that means we can write our integral i as pi by 2 minus the sum over the positive integers k of k times the logarithm of k plus 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus k plus 1 squared minus k times the logarithm of k divided by the square root of 1 plus k squared. So yeah, that is a pretty cool looking infinite series problem. And now all that's left is to evaluate it, which is going to be really cool. So let's call this thing here s. And we're going to evaluate this series by adding a 0. And we need a special form of zero, a really special form of zero. So the form of zero I'm going to use here is first let me write out the rest of the terms to make matters more clear. So we have this horrible term. And I'm going to add the first half of my zero to it. And the first half of my zero is a log k plus 1 divided by 1 plus k plus 1 squared in a square root. So once you add them together, you get a k plus 1 times this logarithm. So you have k plus 1 times the logarithm. Subtract from it this k times this term here, the second half of the general term of this series. This k times log k divided by the square root of 1 plus k squared. And what about the other half of the 0? Well, for that, I'm going to have to write Baker braces. And the other half of the 0 is, of course, negative log k plus 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus k plus 1 squared. And using the linearity of the summation operator, I'm going to write this now as a combination of two sums. So I have a negative sum over the positive integers k of log k plus 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus k plus 1 squared. And this infinite series here is a telescoping series, and you can verify that it sorts out to 
negative natural log 1 by square root 2, which can, of course, be written as log 2 by 2. And it's the second sum now that we're interested in. So writing out s as log 2 divided by 2 minus the sum over the positive integers k of log k plus 1 divided by, now I'm going to invoke some properties of the logarithm here. I can write this as k plus 1 squared in the square root, right? And in the denominator, I have the square root of 1 plus k plus 1 squared. So writing everything in this big old square root thingy here, and using the properties of the logarithm, I can write this as one half the logarithm of all of this stuff. And one half is just a constant multiple, so we can write this outside the summation operator. And once again, using, using the properties of the natural logarithm, if I reciprocate the argument, I introduce an extra negative sign that cancels out with this one. So I have log two divided by two plus one half the sum over the positive integers k of log 1 plus k plus 1, or 1 plus k squared, divided by 1 plus k squared. And some simplification will yield the logarithm of 1 plus 1 by 1 plus k squared, correct? And how exactly do we evaluate this structure? Well, we need some help from complex analysis, specifically Euler's factorization of the sine function. Euler wrote out that sine x divided by x equals the infinite product over the positive integers k of 1 minus x squared divided by pi squared k squared. So what we need to do here is transform from the x world to the i times x world, where i is, of course, the imaginary unit. So we have sine i x, which equals i times the sinh of x, divided by ix, and the two imaginary unit terms cancel out pretty nicely. So we have sinh x by x on the left-hand side. And on the right, we have i squared x squared, and i squared is negative 1, so we're rid of the negative sign. Next up, if we plug in x equals pi, then what we have is the sinh of pi divided by pi being equal to the sum over k of 1 plus pi squared and pi squared cancel out and we have 1 by k squared. And now we need to transform this infinite product structure into an infinite series. So for that we invoke logarithms. So this implies that log sinh of pi divided by pi equals the sum over k of the logarithms of 1 by 1 plus k squared. And does this structure look even a little bit familiar? Let's see. Ah, uh, yes. The structure in green here just requires a transformation from the k plus 1 world to the, to the k world, meaning that you now have the sum over the integer starting at k equals 2 of the logarithm of one, by, uh, 1 plus 1 by k squared. So we have what we need. All we need to do is get rid of the k equals 1 term. And that is pretty easy. Just plug in k equals 1, and you get a log 1 plus 1 by 1, which is log 2. So we have log 2 plus the sum that we need. And on the left, we have the sinh of pi divided by pi, and add negative log 2 on both sides then you can write the left-hand side as log sinh pi divided by 2 pi, which looks pretty nice, and this equals the sum that we needed. So all of this implies that s equals log 2 by 2 minus 1 half of that sum. So we have 1 half of the logarithm of sinh pi divided by pi. Now all that's left is to piece together our solution development, but before that, notice that I've made a sign mistake. It was log 2 by 2 plus 1 half of this sum. So yeah, we're going to have to, well, I'm going to have to fix that. So I have 1 half of this logarithm, and this was supposed to be 2 pi in the denominator. So yeah, apologies. Anyway, so this means that we have i being equal to pi by 2 minus the sum, right? So it's going to be minus log 2 by 2 
minus one half of the natural logarithm of sinh of pi divided by two pi. And we can simplify the solution further to get a pretty nice form. In particular, we can cancel out this log two by two term. So let's write this as pi by two minus log two by two minus one half of log sinh pi divided by pi minus log two. So we have log two, negative log two being multiplied by negative one half. That gives us a positive log two by two, which cancels out with a negative log two by two. And finally, we have i being equal to one half of pi minus the logarithm of sinh pi divided by pi. A beautiful solution development for an amazing integral, and I really had fun evaluating it. And I hope you enjoyed the video as well. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.